Start. Hey, it's Lemon. Welcome to the Backlogs. Today, we're going to finally get into some Salt and Sacrifice. It's been a long time coming. With the game finally patched to what appears to be completion, it's time to see what we can do. And what better way to get into my new favorite game than with a Firebomb Challenge Run? Firebombs are a bit different this go-around, as is the game itself, so we'll have quite a bit to cover before this video is over. I hope you're ready. It's gonna be a wild ride. Alright, so, here's our character. Something you're gonna learn in this playthrough? Your character doesn't matter. As is usually the case with the Firebomb Academy, the Firebomb's gonna do all the work in this challenge run. I just work here. But with the Sage Armor in hand and our character incriminated with arson, it's time to venture forth and get this party started. Nope, no intro for us, thank you. Go ahead and skip this time around. We don't have nearly enough firebombs for that right now. I'll teach the audience how to cheese the intro boss when we do a fist only run. There we are, awake at last. If you're unfamiliar with Salt 2, basically the story is as follows. We are a criminal, and in Alterstone Kingdom, there's two options for criminals. Die at the hands of the law, or become an inquisitor, doomed to hunt mages until the threat is destroyed. We get our health pots, and with no further questions, begin our quest to burn everything that opposes us to the ground. You may have noticed that my character looks a little bit... off. Much like Demon Souls, if you aren't guiltless, aka not human, you'll actually be playing at a slight disadvantage. You can't play online, and more importantly for us, you're down about 20% of your health. Can't have that. But with a little searching of the main hub area, we find some shards and can pop ourselves back to health. There we are. Much better. Am I ready? Girl, I was born for this. Admirable and problematic. Now, normally we'd head right into the world one and get to hunting, but we've got a little bit of preparation to do beforehand. First, we're gonna need some Irona ore. You'll see why in a minute. And second, we're gonna need to grind out this bag here. It's full of random goodies each time you search it. And if you quit to the main menu and load back in, that same bag will reappear with new loot and a new chance at what we really want. Come on, baby, give me what I need. All right, well, not exactly the version I was looking for at the moment, but still great. Ah, there we are. Firebombs, free of charge and ripe for the taking. And since we can do this little trick as many times as we like, there you have it. Infinite firebombs. Combine this with infinite poison bombs we have at our disposal as well, and things are already looking up. But don't get too cocky. There's a few problems we'll need to address later on down the line. Hello, World One. Did you miss me? First, the question we all need answered. Are firebombs still overpowered? Y yeah 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 they're pretty good. But, in an effort to keep the balance, the developers have implemented the one thing that every firebomb build I've ever created hates. Inventory limit. Run out of firebombs, and you're a sitting duck. Oh, and you only get five. Sounds bad, right? Well, it would be, if not for two methods of restocking. We can rest at any obelisk on the map, which restocks all of our supplies. Or, you can waste a shot of ranged ammunition, then hold B to craft more. But you know what else gets crafted when you craft that ranged ammunition? Oh yeah. We're in business. Now, I'm not sure if this is intended, considering I can't just hold B when I run out of firebombs to restock them. I can only restock when I have missing ammunition. But who am I to ask questions in regards to limitless firebombs? So, with this new strategy in mind, let's go fight our first boss. Urix, Necklace of Ears. Place your guesses now. Is this another three bombs in your dead situation? Well, we can't always be a complete monster. That said, the build is definitely pulling its weight already. One toss is about 15% of his health. I can work with that. And when we're out of bombs, I just casually run to one side of the arena, let off a shot of ammunition, then spring on over to the other side, where I quickly craft my single piece of ammo and five more firebombs. And just like that, that's the first boss taken down. Not bad. Not bad at all. It won't always be that easy, of course. The need to restock in the middle of a fight is going to be something I'll always need to work around. But it could be worse. Eh, the artifact we got doesn't help us. Ah well, we've got a lot more bosses to kill. I'm sure we'll find something more useful soon. Hey pal, you look a little bit tired. Mind if I use your grappling hook? Thanks. And with grappling hook in hand, let's see what kind of treasure we can get into. Ooh, what do we have here? Alright, not bad. Not great, but not bad. I'll be honest, I play this game like a complete madman. You're supposed to treat it somewhat like Monster Hunter, where you grind out a boss over and over again in an effort to collect enough materials to make all the gear that comes from each one. But we're not going to do that today. No, today we're going to beat the entire game with zero mage grinding and zero upgrades. Why, you may ask? Because I can. And because I've heard a lot of players grumble about how grindy or difficult the game is. And I want to prove to them it doesn't have to be. Call me stubborn. 
So with that preamble out of the way, let's get to our first hunt, the Pyromancer. If anyone's going to be a problem for a firebomb run, it's going to be him. Well, we could just go in full throttle and start throwing firebombs, but that would be wasteful. Instead, I'm just going to let the mobs around the map do the dirty work. For those of you who are new to the game, before we can officially fight a mage, we have to hunt them down and weaken them. And once weakened, they'll retreat to their lair, where we can officially finish them off. It's not as simple as hitting them while they run away, though. They'll summon multiple minions to protect themselves, all of which have their own patterns and attacks. You know, you'd think that the Pyromancer would be immune to flame, but, uh, yeah. Seems to be working on him and his crew. So much so that it only takes a minute or two of chasing to get him back to his arena. Azar Tin, the Ceaseless Fury. Oh nice, halfway dead already. The Pyromancer is really big on creating damage over time effects and blasting large portions of the arena with fire. But once you know his moveset, it's not overly difficult to dodge. It takes about 10 firebombs to get him down, but down he will indeed go. There's just one problem. Firebombs currently only do status effect damage. And for some reason, don't ask me why, Salt 2 says that status damage is not enough to kill a mage. It needs to be physical. Just to double check, I threw a poison bomb at him too. But despite the number on top of his head ticking downward, that health bar refuses to drop. So, for the time being, we're going to have to allow a single punch so that we can actually progress the game. <sighs> I'm not mad, I'm just disappointed. There we are. Down he goes, and in goes my happy fun stick. There, see? That wasn't so bad. One mage down. Before we head on to our next mage though, let's see what we can make from the Pyromancer's remains. Lots of armor, lots of weapons, ah, here we go. The Pyromancer's Crease. It increases all fire damage by about 10%. All fire damage, including fire bombs. I think you see where this is going. And what better way to test out our new toy than by going after the Cryomancer? This should be good. There he is, Selah's End. He's got several minions that he summons, but they're all extremely weak to fire bombs. Like, exceptionally so. But I guess that makes sense, considering, well, you know. You know what I love about fire bombs? I don't have to give extra thought to enemies with shields. Just fire and forget. But with all his minions melted, there's nowhere else for Celis to run. Time to get to work. Here, hold my bomb. Oh my god, look at that damage. It took four fire bombs to knock him into death range. Four. You know what? How about we kill him with a little extra flare? Ha ha! Huh. Okay, I guess the poise break attack doesn't count either. Strange. Well, whatever. With minimal effort and slightly less pizzazz than I was hoping for, the Chiromancer goes down. Back at home base, we've got more goodies to choose from. We could get a ring that boosts our stamina by a small amount, but considering the only thing I'm using stamina for is dodging and sprinting, we really don't need to worry about that. A knife that increases cold damage might come in handy though. Oh, our buddy the merchant is finally back at home base as well. And guess what he sells for relatively cheap? Yep. You guessed it, supplies for the run. I'll take those, thank you. Next up is Kundri Khan, the Hydromancer. Once again, sounds like a boss that would be the bane of our existence, right? Well, you'd think so, but uh, yeah, not the case. Looks like frog legs are back on the menu, boys. I burned my way past all of his minions, and before you know it, I've hardcore parkoured my way up to the boss arena. Time to see if we're in for a bad time. Eh, nah, we'll be fine. With our build being focused on ranged attacks, all we need to do is carefully time our throws and make sure to stand in the safe zones of all of his attacks. And so long as you time your block, some of his harder hitting attacks like his giant bubble become nothing more than a timing check. It takes a single restock to carry us to the finish line, but with only six firebombs, the Hydromancer is reduced to zero. God, I will never get tired of doing that. Grappling hook poise breaks are an amazing idea. Imagine if I had an actual weapon. God, I love this game so much! Back to base, where we have an interesting dilemma. There's no rings, amulets, or daggers that really help us, but there is this. Deep pods. Technically a ranged weapon, it falls under the category of weapons known as thrown items. Kind of like firebombs. Look, it even acts the same as well. Follows an arc, explodes on contact. The only difference between firebombs and deep pods is that the pods use ammunition, while firebombs and firebomb equivalents are all consumables. And as badly as I want to say they count as a firebomb equivalent, I feel like I need to prove a point. So, though it pains me to do so, we won't be using any of the thrown item weapons during this run. Scaling weapons be damned. The only stats we need are vitality and endurance. So with that moral dilemma out of the way, it's time for the Venomancer, Varen Overin. Varen is your typical poison user, casting poisonous darts, summoning snakes to do her bidding, or snake-like creatures, in any case. Man, you've got a lot of health for someone who's all skin and bones. And basically just creating all sorts of poisonous gases and projectiles. You know, 
Credit where credit is due. I think we're finally getting to the point where I can't knock down a boss with less than 10 firebombs. She's a little faster than the other mages we fought before, but not fast enough to actually interrupt my crafting. And with a little encouragement, she goes down. As far as World 1 is concerned, we've only got one more mage to go. Anything good over here? Ooh, poison knife that increases poison damage. I could see that being useful later on down the line. So far, we've only been using two types of bombs. Fire bombs, which do a lot of damage for a very short amount of time, and poison bombs, which do a very small amount of damage over what feels like a minute or two. While the poison bombs have been a bit too weak for my taste up to this point, maybe the poison dagger will be enough to boost that damage a bit. And what better way to test that than with the green huntsman? By the looks of things, poison works very similarly to how it worked in the first game. A slow start at first, but apply more damage with successive hits, and you'll see that number tick faster and faster. Still nothing in comparison to the firebomb damage, but hey, every little bit helps. I was a little worried that I wouldn't be able to restock my bombs this fight, since the Huntsman attacks quicker and quicker as the fight goes on, but I was able to just barely get a craft in. And because the Huntsman isn't actually a mage, there's no heart to consume, which means that status damage we've been applying can take him all the way down. Up next is the final mage of the area, Ekrix, the Electromancer. Part fire and part light, this boss might be a little difficult. He's resistant to my firebombs, which is problematic, and his attacks, when they connect, can do upwards of 60 damage per hit. Better you than me. His minions are also very annoying, and hit just as hard as he does, which makes it very difficult to restock during the chase. But we get him to his lair eventually. Just takes some effort. The Electromancer is a big fan of area of effect attacks, so you constantly have to keep moving to stay out of the way. He also has melee attacks, so trying to hug up against him isn't very useful either. I tried to bring a couple friends into the fray with me as well, but, well, let's just say I need new friends now. But, just like before, so long as I can find time to craft more firebombs, the fight is basically a guaranteed victory. And once his health bar hits zero, I grapple onto his horns and give him the old one-two punch. That's every mage in World 1 dealt with. Time for a change of scenery. How, you ask? Why, by talking to the trees, of course. With a new rune for our portal learned, we can head on down to World 2. Oh, I also grabbed a dagger that boosts my attack power by quite a bit whenever my health dips below 20%. I don't think that applies to my bombs, but if I get stuck, it might be our last resort. A few more points into vitality, a quick stop at the firebomb vendor, and a few resources converted into a larger complement of flasks, and we're finally ready to head out to Bulgaran. A whole new world, a whole new batches of mages and equipment to find. Ugh, sand. I hate sand. Let's see if the inhabitants are more fire resistant, what with being in a desert and all. Okay, nope, no issues there. Man, even some of the heftier enemies of the area only take two firebombs. Combine that with the stunlock capabilities, and you've got a reliable recipe for dealing with troublesome mobs. But, after being insulted by a tree... Ow, I pride. I come to the first boss of World 2, the hate-cursed matriarch. And to those of you screaming, Lemon, that's just Quaylag! Let me point out that she can, in fact, be poisoned. Oh, and burned. See? Completely different. Do, do, do you think they bought it? The matriarch isn't too bad. She's a slow attacker, and isn't very good at countering ranged attacks. Just keep on your toes, roll when necessary, and make sure to toss a firebomb every few seconds, and you'll be just fine. See? First try, just like everyone else. But, unlike everyone else, she gave me an actually useful artifact. Plus 7% alchemy damage. That doesn't affect firebombs and poison bombs, but it will affect a few of the consumable crafting items we'll be making shortly. I collect some magic marbles that let me zipline across the skies, immediately use them to get the nearby systems going, and find our next target, the Aeromancer. But before we hunt him down, I've got a few new ores to collect in this area. Any ore node that glows red has a potential chance to drop two unique ores, which in turn can be made into unique consumables. Bet you're wondering if they're firebombs or firebomb equivalents. Well, let's go ahead and bring them to our druid friend here and find out. Yep, all signs point to yes. Back to the Aeromancer. His summons all hit extremely hard, despite looking like... uh... that. The Aeromancer himself is pretty slow, but he does have a nasty habit of turning entire swaths of the arena into tornadoes. Combine that with the fact that he's resistant to fire damage, and we've got a bit of a war of attrition on our hands. Once he's cornered, the Aeromancer has a large blade that he can lawn more across the arena with. And his arena is pretty small, so all of his tornadoes become that much more of a problem. Or at least, they would be, if I weren't able to take out entire chunks of his health bar from long range with only a few firebombs. You know, I'm starting to get a little worried. My first playthrough of this game was an epic struggle with each fight taking upwards of 5 tries to get through. We may have broken the game. Well, let's go see what's new at the home base. The Stable Master has some new duds for us to wear. Very nice, my guy. 
I'll wear them later when I can fast roll in them. It also looks like our secondary firebombs are on the druid's list of items, which means that she can give us a larger inventory limit for them if we find the right materials. We'll have to keep an eye out for that. And for our efforts against the Aeromancer, we now have a ring that regenerates our stamina even faster. Speedrunner's delight. But it's time we moved on. Time for the Terramancer. He's a big brute of a mage. He hits hard and is resistant to pretty much every single element and damage type. Not too bright though, guess he skipped head day. His minions are just as tall and healthy as he is, though quite a bit quicker. Way quicker than you'd think they ought to be. But after several minutes of hunting him down, he's finally cornered. The Immovable Bastion. We'll put that name to the test. The Terramancer is a boss of timing. He can attack you pretty much anywhere on the map, but he telegraphs his attack incredibly clearly. All you need to do is dodge. His hardest attack to dodge is his wombo combo. Stand too close to him after he slams the ground with his fist, and he'll come at you like a landslide. And man does he do some damage. Keep an eye out for it though, and you'll be able to navigate through his attacks. And if you need to restock in the middle of the fight, he takes forever to maneuver his way from one side of the arena to the other, so you've got the time. Come on man, take a hint and just die already. Finally. Jesus, that was a long one. Still first try though. Not a whole lot of useful items from him for this run. There's an amulet that heals me if I perfect block any attacks, which is fine, I guess. We don't have any other amulet at the moment, so it'll do for now. I also have a new toy to play with. Blast Roar Decoctions, aka Physical Firebombs. Let's find something to test those out on, shall we? How about the Tireless Exalted? Yeah, you'll do. You'll do nicely. The Exalted is a strange boss that really gave me a lot of trouble my first playthrough of the game. Rather than focus on physical attacks, the Exalted is more likely to summon spirits that slowly home in on your location. The damage they do is negligible, but that's not why they're a threat. It took me the longest time to notice it, but the spirits actually have a death effect that builds up pretty quickly. Take enough hits to fill up the bar, and you lose a lot of health. Like, a lot of health. So don't do that. Instead, just roll through all the homing spirits and soul masses as if you were dodging any other projectile. And if you manage to keep from getting hit while simultaneously throwing in a fire or poison bomb every so often, the Exalted will go down without too much trouble. And with him out of the way, it's time for our next mage. The Necromancer. Tony's. Why's it always gotta be Tony's? Much like the Exalted, you'll find yourself dodging a lot of skulls and spirits. But unlike the Exalted, the Necromancer also has several long range spells that you'll need to learn how to block. Otherwise, you're gonna be in for a bad time. The spirits are also a bad time if you don't move correctly. They're weirdly hard to get rid of, and seem to follow a bit too well for my liking. But with a little practice and timing, that healing amulet I got may actually carry us through to victory. Every little bit of healing helps. And with a final perfect block and a punch to the knee, the Necromancer goes down. I'll show you to summon my sworn enemy in droves! As far as goodies go, the only thing the Necromancer is offering is a ring that increases silver find. That would be good if we weren't already drowning in firebombs, but I'll make a mental note of it in case we ever get low. On to the Thaumamancer, aka the Holy Mancer, for us lay folk. If you were wondering where all the fun holy spells and Deus Volt went in Salt 2, now you know. Our boy here has them all. A little bit of blessed weapon, a little bit of sprites, you know, the whole gambit. As far as the fight itself goes, it's not bad at all. The Thaumamancer's spells tend to lean towards the slower side, and with our attacks causing damage over time, we only need one opportunity every few seconds. And with his health dwindling down to zero, it's only a matter of time before we give our boy the old tall boy special. My only regret is I can't use the weapons that I can craft from his materials. Some holy bombs would be great right about now. But arbitrary rules are arbitrary rules. I talk to a dying soldier in the sewers of the temple, and get the rune I need to head on over to World 3. There's technically one more mage here in World 2, but we can't reach him without the Inquisitor tool from the next map, so we'll just have to backtrack a bit later. Time to- what the- what do you mean it's closed? It's a dimension door! You can't just lay claim to a dim door! I want to speak to the manager. Oh, shit, that's actually the king. I, uh, I didn't plan this far ahead. The king's assistant here tells me we need to find the runes that will get us to the Elder Cops, because the kingdom is losing its battle to the mages, and a solution needs to be found. Sounds awful, I'm in. So with that, it's on to Blighttown. Er, Corvius's Mire. Oh come on, you knew there was going to be a poison swamp level. There's always a poison swamp level. I do a little exploring, and renew my fear of opening chests, because Dark Souls 1 and Salt 1 didn't scar me enough. Then I go after the first mage of World 3, the Fungal Mancer. Focused mainly on creating minions and poisonous shrooms and fogs, this boss is why you need a healthy supply of antidotes. I will say that, as annoying as it is that he's basically a summoner mage, his minions are really cool. Look at that boy. How can you hate something as cute as that? Okay, well, maybe not that one. Just, uh, 
just ignore that one. Funny story, when the Fungal Mancer and I finally got to the arena, it was already taken. This ought to be interesting. I stayed out of it as best as I could, but I think we're witnessing the fact that the Fungal Mancer has the superior poison. In any case, with the squatter dealt with, the Fungal Mancer isn't too bad. He focuses on area of effects, usually followed by summoning Mushroom Pals to take advantage of your now limited mobility. Unfortunately for him, he's too slow to react to my crafting, and without any way to slow me down, he's as good as dead. Wait, what? Oh, you know, I guess that actually makes sense. Physical firebombs can knock a mage into death mode. Go figure. I guess with that in mind, we didn't have to punch every mage in the knee up to this point. We could have gotten these physical firebombs after killing just one. Ah well, live and learn. This is your fault, Inquisitor. Good. Good. Hardly. The mages that roam this realm are not aggressors, but the mocked Inquisitors are. We received knowledge which could have been used to help all. Instead, the Inquisition bore down on us and destroyed us. The chaos that engulfs us is all your fault, Marked Inquisitor. Live with that, and I shall rest in peace. Huh. We, uh... We may be the bad guys here. But hey, why dwell on that when we can get some new gear? I'm thinking an amulet that increases your climbing and grappling speed. That sounds just like something I'd be into. Oh yeah. Oh, that's much better. I also found a new poison bomb from the ore in the mire, so that's helpful. Probably. Next up is Grandma Blighttown. Grandma B is a weird one. She can shoot missiles made of poison, summon wooden dolls to attack you, which, by the way, have horrifying backstories, and she can turn invisible, which would be detrimental if not for the constant damage ticks. Kinda hard to hide with those. All things considered, an easy fight for a Firebomb Academy Scholar. She did give me a new artifact that helps me regenerate stamina even faster, though. No complaints here. And with her defeated, we now have the Lumen Stone, which lets me summon hidden platforms and grappling hooks whenever I find a rune circle. One more tool to find, and this world is our oyster. I also found the second ore of the world, Dismin Ore. Basically a dark damage firebomb. Not gonna lie, I'm enjoying having so many options to choose from. It really makes my life easier. All these new firebombs also benefit from that alchemy damage boost I got earlier, and count as something that can be crafted, so I no longer have to shoot a ranged weapon to reload my firebombs. We're officially all firebombs, all the time. On to the next mage, the Corpumancer. Think horror movies and games, and you've got a good idea of what this mage can do. Flesh hooks spawning everywhere, minions that look like they came straight out of dead space, and abilities that make you a feast for flies before you even know what's happening. How do I get out? How do I get out? Damn it. Alright, fine. I guess World 3 is as good a place as any to die for the first time. Turns out you need to press the attack buttons in order to break out of the cage which I haven't been pressing this entire run. Guess that explains that. Aside from casting flies, this mage is primarily focused on melee attacks, and therefore isn't very hard for our build. We can craft with relative ease, since she's so slow, and without her fancy case trick to rely on, she goes down on the next try. Clever girl, but not clever enough. All of her items focus on increasing melee attack power. Useless for us, but great if you're playing, you know, normally. But before we continue slaughtering all of World 3, we can actually reach the last World 2 boss now with our Lumen Stone, the Sanguimancer, also known as a Blood Mage. Vampire? Eh, yeah, whatever. This mage always gave me trouble. Not only do they hit hard, but they're the first mage we've come across who has been melee focused and quick as hell. Get caught in that wombo combo, and you're as good as dead. He also summons blood lasers on occasion to force you to get even closer to him, which is never a good time. But, much like the other mages, if you can lure him into a corner with one of his attack animations, you can just barely get a crafting session in. Which means the rest of the fight is all about patience. There we are, World 2 completely done. None of his equipment will be helpful for us this playthrough, so back to Blight Town we go. I clamber my way into and up the great tree in the center of the map, where we come to our next boss, the Sap Blood Heart. This boss is a weird one. It summons ghosts very akin to the coveted from Salt 1, who attack on occasion and can't be harmed. Rather than that, it mostly just sits there. At least, it does until you do enough damage. Then it transforms like a gobot and comes after you itself. Do enough damage though, and you'll lull it back to sleep, but not before it summons more ghosties to deal with. Strange little fight, really. The steady ramp up of difficulty as the fight continues is actually really neat and well done. Nothing we can't handle, of course, but still. Cool fight all the same. With the heart cleared though, we now have access to an important rune circle, one that teaches me several of the portal runes we were missing. We can't quite get to World 5 just yet, but we're on the right path. Oh, and in case you were wondering, I'm currently level 48, and I haven't put points into anything except Vitality and Endurance. Which means I can finally wear slightly heavier armor and still keep my fast roll. 
Hooray! But we've still got two more mages before we can move on to world four. What, uh, what happened here? Almost looks like I've been here. Ah, uh, that's why. It's the Mechanomancer. And while he does focus on machines, he also has bombs. Lots and lots of bombs. I'd be lying if I told you I didn't use his throwing weapons in my main playthrough. All of his craftable weapons are so odd. The man has a freaking chainsaw greatsword for crying out loud. As far as this run is concerned though, he's just another Firebomb Academy Scholar who's turned from the light. What happened, guy? You were so close. You had the flamethrower and everything. Where'd you go wrong? You know the drill by now. Craft in a corner when you can, unleash hell whenever you can't. And before you know it, the Mechanomancer will fall. You were the chosen one! You were supposed to destroy the mages, not join them! Unfortunately, the only equipment of his that I can use increases carrying capacity. But my slots are kind of already being used by other items at the moment. My armor has been holding up pretty well thus far, but if I need heavier stuff, I'll keep that in mind. But it's time to finish World 3. Last up is the Luminomancer. Luminomancer? Lumina... The, the mage that uses light. The hardest part about this boss is that you can't see them until you're right up on them. I guess that makes sense. If a mage can manipulate light, they'd be very good at hiding in plain sight. Alright, Lucian. Let's get this over with. I have places to be. With his ability to hide inside refracted light removed now that we've got him cornered, Lucian is very much a boss that relishes in turning the entire arena into a minefield. He has a bit of everything, from repeatedly exploding light mines to lasers that rip across the field. He also gets more and more animalistic as the fight goes on. Interesting how you can see the desperation slowly closing in. But, just like all the rest, once he's cornered, he's as good as dead. His equipment is nothing worth looking at as far as our build is concerned, so with that, World 3 is completely done. Time to move on. But before we do, I found one last bit of hidden ore in the mire. Steel glass, which gives me a frost-based bomb to throw at enemies. This pleases me. Can't wait to use that against, um, well shit, looks like nature beat me to it. Right, let's dive right into it. First up is a dual boss, the two that remain. Don't say it, they're completely different. See, they have a sword and an axe, don't you say it! With two of them on the field at once, this fight becomes a bit hectic for our build. Not only do they both have different resistances and attacks, but with both of them jumping and attacking separately, it's a bit harder to make room to get some crafting in. Not impossible, mind you, just a bit harder. You'll probably end up taking damage, so be prepared for that. They also start to use magical attacks that limit the arena even more once they're in the final stages. So stay on your toes, focus on getting in damage whenever you can, and let the damage over time status effects do all the work. Thankfully, they both share the same health bar, so if you kill one, you kill them both. With the two that remain no longer remaining, we can get our final tool, which means that every secret in the game is now ours for the taking. We won't be doing too much exploring, but I'm sure there'll be one or two material upgrades that I can find with this to improve our stockpile limits. Up next, we have the Neuromancer. Oh, great, I love puzzles. Yeah, wait, this isn't what I meant. Brain teasers, brain teasers. What's worse is the fact that if you're hit with enough attacks from the Neuromancer, you get the confusion status effect, which means all of your controls get switched around on you. I know you can't really see it, but I just tried to roll and drink a health potion instead. If that happens when we get into the actual boss arena, we may as well kiss that attempt goodbye. Speaking of, let's see what we're in for. The Neuromancer loves to make mobility puzzles with every attack, creating a web of nodes you'll need to carefully dodge through in order to get back into range. Thankfully, it seems like that's the only truly ranged spell he has, so as long as we're able to navigate our way through the attack, we'll be okay. He's definitely more of a melee focused mage. Can't wait to deal with that in a future playthrough. Right then, Neuromancer down. That wasn't too bad. If the mist comes after the dawn, but before the sun. And an egg comes after breakfast, but before an illness. Which comes first? Life, death, or the beyond? Woo, brain teasers. He's doing brain teasers. The beyond, naturally. Correct. A parting gift for you. Oh, hey, he actually gives you something for figuring it out. Awesome. All right, Chronomancer is up next. If this hourglass is any indication, we're in for a good time. Or some quality of time, anyway. Y you get it. Let me just turn on all these lifts and we can- Whoa! Uh, nope, that's not a Chronomancer if I've ever seen one. I'll deal with that later. Ah, that's better. What the- No, 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 no. We don't need any more Untouched Inquisitors. We already have the Untouched Inquisitor at home. Fun fact about the Chronomancer, the clock on his back tells the actual time. Just a neat little detail. Fucking love this fight. Not only does the Chronomancer summon attacks out of the Ethereal Rift, which is just cool in itself, but he also makes time fields across the arena that slow down anything that goes through them, be it Firebomb or Firebomb Thrower. It's just such a cool idea. I love it so much. Anyway, take your lumps. And with those lumps taken, the Chronomancer gives us the greatest gift of all. 
an amulet that increases our restock speed. This build just became unstoppable. Here's what it's like without it, and here's what it's like when it's sped up. That's better, much better, let's go. On to the Diablo Mancer. Sounds like the one I bumped into earlier. Uh, yep, that's him all right. Not gonna lie, this boss was hard. He has a healthy combination of melee and ranged attacks, and both of them do a lot of damage. Let yourself get cornered, and you're gonna have a really bad time. What's more, if you aren't quick to get on the other side of him whenever he summons explosive runes, you're likely going to find yourself in a position where you can't really move. Which means death. This boss was my brick wall. I must have died here at least 10 times. It took me a while to realize it, but it turns out that I was just being too aggressive. I was more concerned with throwing firebombs as fast as I could, instead of being more present in the fight and recognizing where his attacks were going to land. It took several close calls and multiple tries to get it right, but eventually the Diablo Mancer went down. Whew, okay, no more of that please. And from his remains, we can make a ring that lets me drink my health potions a little faster. Not essential, but definitely useful. The Inquisition produces as many mages as it destroys. Inquisitors go mad with mage bane and become mages themselves, soon to be purged by the next batch of Inquisitors. To what end? Why, the sacrifice pleases the gods, of course. The truth. Oh god, we are the bad guys. Just in a way I hadn't really considered. Up next is the Dracomancer, but I'll be honest, my brain isn't really focused on the fight. If the mage hunters are becoming mages themselves, then this whole Inquisitor thing is nothing more than a charade. How much do the higher-ups know? Does Champion Hera know about this? Does the king? I think we need to collect some answers. There has to be a way out of this cycle. You can't just go around and around forever. Hell, I'm fighting literal shadows at this point. Let me deal with this Umbromancer first, and then we can- Holy fuck, that's a lot of damage. This mage actually gave me a lot of trouble. Those waves of shadow are no joke. And even with heavier armor that protects against dark damage, we're still getting more or less one shot. This could be a problem. All right, maybe we just need to block the damage. That might work, okay, nope, bad idea, really bad idea. It took a few tries, but eventually I realized I was just going about the fight all wrong. Unlike a majority of the mages we fought up to this point, the Umbermancer is easier if you fight them up close and personal. His attacks are much easier to dodge in time when you force him to use his blade rather than his wave attacks and on the off chance that he tries to use his wave attack against you, you're in the perfect position to roll to his other side. Do it twice, and you'll dodge the attack every time. Good fight, Chief. Thanks for giving me something to think about. Really helped distract me from that existential dread I was feeling for a minute there. One more boss to go, and then we're on to the final map of the game. Kraxenar, Worm of the Sky. Did I say that right? Holy hell, I think I said that right. Much like Salt 1, Dragon Breath attacks aren't too hard to avoid if you take advantage of the airtime you get from using consumables. That said, Kraxenar's breath attack is just slightly longer than the airtime you get from holding a firebomb, so you might get hit with a few ticks of damage if you time it wrong. Better to just do a few mid-air kicks and call it a day, since that's much more consistent. This boss has a pretty healthy combo of melee and ranged attacks, but I've always found the ranged attacks easier to dodge. And since we've got the option, I just stay out of range and melt him down with status effects like everyone else. Oh, I forgot to mention, I found the last ore of the game, which gives me light damage bombs. We officially have every element under our belt, and a whole complement of firebombs and firebomb accessories at our disposal. God, I love this build. In any case, I find the last tree of the game. It, uh, it appears to be spell marked. That shouldn't happen. Last I heard, that only happens to humanoids. So that bodes well. But hey, we got the final room we needed to access the Elder's Cops. One final push. Huh. Okay. Getting a lot of bad vibes from this place. Yep, bad vibes. Very bad vibes! There's only two mages in World 5. The first is the Kinetomancer. Pretty easy boss for our build. It's another melee focused mage. Normally that would be an issue, but considering how many different firebombs I have now, and the fact that I've gotten very good at dodging attacks throughout this playthrough, I'm not overly worried about it. Combine that with our super fast crafting speed, and this boss is as good as dead. Goodbye Kinetomancer. You were merely an object of force pushing against an immovable object. Never had a chance. That said, I will be taking your fancy dagger which increases my restock speed even more. Sultan Sacrifice, you spoil me! Up next is the final mage, the Bibliomancer. Look at this nerd. Look how he- is that a giant centipede? Ew, 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 ew. This boss gave me a lot of trouble my first playthrough. Let's see how he fares this time around. Hmm, yeah, that's about what I expected. Hey, calm down. No need to try and throw the book at me. I will say, this boss is about as close to the Witch of the Lake as you can get. So, yeah. Watch out for the machine gun attack, because it's definitely just as potent now as it was then. That said, he doesn't use it nearly as much as she used to, and it's a lot easier to dodge this go around. 
Just pay extra attention to where you're positioned, and you can maneuver your way over to the safe side of the Bibliomancer before the spell goes off. Take away that little bit of power he has, and there's nothing more he can really do to you. And with him down, that's the last of the mages destroyed. But we're not quite done yet. We've got two towers to climb in World 5. The Citadel of Sky, and the Temple of Embers. Chances are your lore detector just started going off right about now. I climb my way through each tower, on a mission to defeat the boss waiting at the tops, and collect the special keys they guard. The first boss we'll face is the Icon of Pandemonium. Man, if that isn't a boss design. The Icon focuses mainly on casting lightning all around the room, and tends to fly out of reach between attacks. Is what I would say if we weren't throwing firebombs like a goddamn champion. It has a lot of health, and while I don't know 100% for certain, it does look like most of my status effects aren't doing as much as they normally do. Which is unfortunate. But despite these problems, I've got every type of bomb available, and a few of them definitely do more damage than others. Combine this with my ineffable patience, and the icon goes down with relative ease. I quickly struggle bust my way through the Temple of Embers, doing my best to speedrun through. We could take our time and slowly melt down every enemy in the joint, but come on, who has time for that? And for our efforts, we finally make it to the top, where the worm that does not die waits for us. We'll see about that. As expected, the worm is very fire resistant, and has a whole slew of attacks that encase the entire arena in flames. Thankfully, our long range build makes dodging all of the flame attacks less of a problem, since a majority of its attacks are more melee focused. And so long as we keep our distance and avoid touching any of the very painful flames, a few well placed shadow bombs combined with the multiple status effects we've got going eventually do the trick. Now, before we go tackling the final boss, there's actually a few quest lines I'd like to complete. First, we have to help out Inquisitor Select. Select is constantly getting killed by mages, and needs a guiltless shard at each world. And the second one I want to progress is Inquisitor Ambin's questline. Ambin is an Inquisitor like us, but more inclined towards studying magic than fighting against it. He can also be found once in each world, so with that said, it's time for an easter egg hunt. I find them on each of the maps, watching them slowly grow more and more devoid of their humanity with each interaction. I think you and I both know how this is going to end, the same way it always does. It begins with Select. Giving in to the spell mark at last, he becomes a boss in his own right. He's extremely melee focused, and has no long range attacks whatsoever. That said, he's more than capable of crossing the arena with a single attack, and moves quite a bit faster than the mages were used to fighting, which makes restocking difficult at times. But with our finished build, our restock speed is just fast enough that we can squeeze it in, and with that concern removed, we put Select to rest. I also get my favorite armor in the game, as well as my favorite emote. Good day, you look reasonably sane. Are you a cleric or something? But it doesn't end with Select. On to Ambin, who has finally succumbed to the runes and magic that he so diligently studied. That's right, we get to witness an Inquisitor actually become a mage, confirming that the words of the Diablomancer are true. Ambin is similar to Select in that he's one of the fastest mages we've ever fought, but unlike Ambin, he has a large selection of spells and attacks to choose from. His attacks act as both area of effects and distance closers, which can be pretty tough to dodge. Jesus man, just give me a minute to breathe. A little bit of space is healthy sometimes, you know? But like all the other mages we've fought, he goes down like all the rest. I wonder, what will I find? Peace, my friend. Peace. With the death of our Inquisitor cohorts, it's time we got some answers from the King himself. Unfortunately, he's still in no condition to answer us, but his attendant has plenty of answers. Too many, in fact. Turns out, Alterstone Kingdom, the kingdom we've been killing mages in the name of, has long since collapsed under the weight of mages and their magic. We're the last hope for victory in this unending war against them, and unless we scale the final tower and destroy the root of all magic, there's no hope for the kingdom to rebuild. We're also given a serum, a serum that reveals the truth. And trust me, you don't want to know what that means. Oh, you do? Alright, but don't say I didn't warn you. To show you, I'm gonna have to re-hunt a single mage. So far everything looks normal, nothing out of the ordinary. We finish him off, rip out his heart, as you do, and oh fuck! Oh god, what happened? What the fuck? So yeah, every time the NPCs tell you to go and devour the hearts of mages, literal. All those mage devoured screens we've seen, literal. How deep does this lie go? How many people knew? All questions worth asking, and all questions we don't have time for today. Maybe in future playthroughs. For now though, it's time to finally kill the final boss. But we can't go unprepared. Load up the world of Lemon. That's right. It's time to put all our speedrunning and challenge running skills to the test. Because if we're gonna fight the final boss, we're gonna fight him the right way. There we are, easy peasy. And for our efforts, the armor of the gods. Behold, the Lord of the Harvest has finally arrived. And he is, 
Oh. Oh, no. Fat roll? Eh, never mind. We'll save that for potatoes only two. Carrot boogaloo. You tread on hallowed ground. Mustn't be here. Must go. We'll climb the imperfect shrine. Destroy everything. Uh, yeah, Chief. That's the plan. You seek to climb the imperfect shrine. Seek to end the suffering. But then what will begin in its stead? No. No more questions. No more lies. No more deception. No more hidden horror mouths. We're going to the top. And we're ending this. One way or another. When you reach the top of the imperfect shrine, what will you do? Cut down the suffering sacrifice? And then what? The gods demand sacrifice. Not my problem. This needs to end. There he is. The final sacrifice. Acting as a diem against the wrath of the gods. Or he was, before his mind broke and he became the very reason the mages exist. Time to silence the whispers. The Undone Sacrifice is a fitting final boss. He has multiple melee attacks, all of which hit pretty hard, a myriad of ranged attacks that fire tree roots directly at you, or chase after you and keep you from sitting still and throwing ranged attacks nonstop. And my personal favorite is grab attack. <coughs> God, that's brutal. All in all, a fitting final boss for the run. He has a lot of health, and doesn't appear to take much damage from the status effects I keep trying to apply, but with enough patience and mastery of his movesets, it'll be enough. Because if there's one thing I've learned in my years of being the headmaster of the Firebomb Academy, it's that with enough firebombs, even nameless gods and their kin may fall. And so, the game is finally over. And we have a choice. We can climb the tree, and take the sacrifice's place, inevitably continuing this cycle. Or, we can devour it, and face whatever wrath the gods may visit upon us. Let them come. <laughs>